In under five minutes, she was fluttering her wet hair and sliding past Shane in a breathless rush to grab her backpack and stuff it with books. Where the hell are you going? He asked from the doorway. He didn't sound sleepy now. She zipped the bag shut, hefted it on the shoulder that wasn't aching or complaining, and turned toward him without answering. He was leaning on the doorframe, arms folded, head cocked. Oh, you've got to be kidding. What, you've got some kind of death wish? You really want to get knocked down another flight of stairs or something? You made the deal, they won't come after me. Don't be dense. Leave that to the experts. You really think they don't have ways around it? She walked up to him, staring up into his face. He looked enormously tall, and he was big, and in her way. And she didn't care. You made a deal, she said, and I'm going to, to the library. Please get out of the way. Please? Damn girl, you need to learn how to get mad, or she shoved him. It was dumb, and he had the muscle to stay right where he was, but surprise was on her side. And she got him to stumble a couple of steps back. She was already out the door and heading out. She was in hand. She wasn't about to stop and give him another chance to keep her nice and safe. Hey! He caught up, grabbed her arm, and spun her around. I thought you said you wouldn't. At night, she said, and turned to go down the stairs. He let go, and she slipped. For a scary second, she was off balance, teetering on the edge of the stairs, and then Sheen's warm hands closed around her shoulders and pulled her back to balance. He held her there for a few seconds. She didn't turn around, because if she did, then he was right there. Well, she didn't know. She didn't know what would happen. See you. She gulped and went down the stairs as fast as she dared, on shaking legs. The heat of the morning was like a toaster oven, only without a yummy food smells. There were a couple of people out on the street. One lady was pushing a baby stroller, and for a second, while Claire was sitting down to put on her battered running shoes, she considered that with a kind of wonder. Having babies in town like this, what were people thinking? But she guessed they did it anyway, no matter how horrible it was. And there was a bracelet around the woman's slender wrist. The baby was safe. At least until it turned 18. Claire glanced down at her own bare wrist, shivered, and put it out of her mind and she set off the campus. Now that she was looking, just about every, every person she passed had something around his or her wrist. Braces for the women, watch bands for the men. She couldn't tell what the symbols were. She needed to find some kind of alphabet. Maybe somebody had done research and put it somewhere safe. Somewhere the vampires wouldn't look. She'd always felt safest at the library. She went straight there, watching over her shoulder for Monica, Gina, Jennifer, or anybody who looked remotely interested in her. Nobody did. TPU's library was huge and dusty. Even librarians at the front looked like they might have picked up a cobweb or two since her last visit. More proof if she needed it that TPU was first and only a party school. She checked the map for the shelves and saw that the Dewey Decimal System reigned in Morganville. Which was weird, because she thought all the universities were on the Library of Cog- Congress system. She traced through the listings looking for references and found them in the basement. Great. As she started to walk away, though, she cocked her head and looked at the list again. There was something strange about it. She couldn't quite put her finger on it. There wasn't a fourth floor. Not on the list anyway. And Mr. Dewey's system jumped straight from the third floor to the fifth. Maybe it was offices, she thought, or storage, or shipping, or coffins. It was definitely weird, though. She started to take the stairs down to the basement, then stopped and tilted her head back. The stairs were old school, with massive wooden railings, turning in precise L-shaped angles all the way up. What the hell? she thought. It was only a couple of flights of stairs she could always pretend she'd gotten lost. She couldn't hear anything or anybody once she'd left the first floor. It was silent as. She hated to think it. The grave. She tried to go quietly on the stairs and quit gripping the banister when she realized that there was a leaving, sweaty, betraying handprints behind. She passed the second floor wooden door. And then the third. Nobody visible through the clear glass window. The fourth door didn't even have a door. Claire stopped, puzzled, and touched the wall. Nope. No door. No secret she could see. Just a blank wall. Was it possible there was no fourth floor? She went up to the fifth floor, made her way through the silent, dusty stacks to the other set of stairs, and went down. On this side, there was a door, but it was locked. And there weren't any windows. Definitely not officers, she guessed. 
but coffins weren't out of the question. Damn it. She resented being scared in a library. Books weren't supposed to be scary. They were supposed to help. If she was some kick-ass superhero chick, she'd probably be able to pick the lock with a fingernail clipping or something. Unfortunately, she wasn't a superhero. And she bit her fingernails. No, she wasn't a superhero. But she was something else. She was resourceful. Standing there, staring at the lock, she began to smile. Applied science, she said, and ran down the stairs to the first floor. She had a stop to make in chem lab. Her TA was in his office. Well, he said, if you're ready to want to shatter a lock, you need something good like liquid helium. But liquid helium isn't all that portable. What about Freon? Claire asked. No, you can't get your hands on the stuff without a license. What you can buy is a different formulation. It doesn't get us cold, but it's more environmental friendly. But it probably wouldn't do the job. Liquid nitrogen? Same problem as helium. Too bulky. Claire sighed. Too bad. It was a cool idea, the TA smiled. Yes, it was. You know, I have a portable liquid nitrogen tank I keep for school demonstrations. But they're hard to get. Pretty expensive. Not the kind of thing you'd find lying around. Sorry. <clears throat> he wandered off, intent on some post-grade experiment of his own. And he promptly forgot all about her. She bit her lip, stared at his back for a while, and then slowly, very slowly, moved back to the door that led to the supply room. It was unlocked so that the TA could easily move in and out if he needed to. Red and yellow signs on him warned that she was going to get cancer. Suffocate or die of the horrible deaths if she opened the door. But she did it anyway. It squeaked. The TA had to have heard it. And she froze like a mouse in front of an oncoming bird. Guilty. He didn't turn around. In fact, he deliberately kept his back to her. She let out a shaky breath, eased into the room and looked around. The place was neatly kept, all the chemicals labeled and stored with the safety information for each hanging below it. He stored in alphabetical order. She found the liquid nitrogen sign and saw a bulky, very obvious tank. And a small one next to it, like a giant thermos, with a shoulder strap. She grabbed it and then read the sign. Use protective gloves, the sign said. The gloves were right there, too. She shoved a pair in her backpack, slung the canister over her shoulder, and got the hell out of there. The librarians didn't even give her a second look. She waved and smiled and went into the stacks, all the way to the back stairs. The door was just as she left it. She fumbled on the gloves, opened the top of the canister, and found that there was a kind of steel pepe that fit into the nozzle. She made sure it was in place, and then opened the valve, held her breath, and began pouring super cool liquid into the lock. She wasn't sure how much to use. Too much was better than not enough. She guessed and kept pouring until the out side of the lock was completely frosted. Then she cranked the valve shut and reminded herself to get keep the gloves on. Yanked on the doorknob. Crack. It sounded like a gunshot. She jumped, looked around and realized the knob had moved in her hand. She opened the door. Nothing to do now but go inside. But somehow that didn't like such a great idea. Now that she was actually able to do it. Because coffins were worse. Claire sucked in a steadying breath, opened the door and carefully looked around the edge. It looked like a storeroom, files, stacks of cartons and wooden crates. No one in sight. Great, she thought. Maybe I did just break into the file room. That would be disappointing. Still, she stuffed the gloves in her backpack, just in case. The cartons looked new, but the contents, when she unwrapped the string, time one closed. It appeared old. Crumbling books, badly preserved, ancient letters and papers in languages she couldn't read, some of which looked like ancestors or English. She tried the next box. More of the same, the room was vast, and was full of this kind of stuff. The book, she thought. They're looking for the book. Every old book they find comes here, and gets examined. Now that she looked, she saw that the crates had small red X marks on them, meaning they'd been gone through. Initials, too. Somebody was being held accountable, which meant somebody was working here. She had just enough time to form the thought when two people walked out of the maze of boxes ahead of her. They weren't hurrying, and they weren't alarmed. Vampires. She didn't know how she knew. They weren't exactly dressed for the part, but the way they moved, loose and sure, screamed predator at her fragile prey brain. Well, she said in sort of blonde girl, we don't get many visitors here. 
except for the pallor of her face and the glitter in her eyes. She looked like a hundred other girls out on the squad. She was wearing pink. It seemed wrong for vampires to be wearing pink. 